in the English, reverence, humility, reverence, humility, contentment, gratitude, contentment, gratitude, and the timely hearing of the Dhamma. And the timely hearing of the Dhamma. This is the highest blessing. This is the highest blessing. Okay, so the first of these inner qualities or inner virtues that's mentioned here is that of reverence. And I think we can see that reverence is in a sense the quality that opens the whole door to the prospect for real spiritual development. Because if we come into the spiritual practice just seeking to gain some like special attainments in order to bolster our sense of self-importance and um, to inflate our ego, then we're using the practice and whatever results come from the practice as a kind of, call it a spiritual materialism. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you approach without real reverence, I would say that whatever super experiences you have, are likely to be deluding experiences, sort of distortions that are coming in through the influence of the ego rather than through genuine accomplishment. So what is sort of the root idea behind reverence? And I was just reflecting on that as I was taking the walk. By the way, if you want to attain nirvana, <laughs> if you take a walk down this road, to the place where they, there's a yard where all of the boats are kept. You'll see the first boat that I, that I saw in that yard is named Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was thinking, like, what is sort of the root idea behind reverence? And it struck me that I think what lies behind reverence is the intuitive sense that there is some call it a sacred reality which is of ultimate value and which then in some sense sort of suffuses or extends its influence down into this world. So some state of like ultimate sacred value which transcends this world but then spreads its influence down into this world so that things in this world, in a sense, partake of that sacred reality. And so, in the Buddha's teaching, we could say that that sacred reality that is the source of ultimate value would be Nibbana. And then the Dhamma, the Buddha's teaching, as the channel through which the dump, through which that sacred reality becomes accessible to us, also partakes, you could say, or participates in the sacredness of that ultimate sacred reality. And so, within the framework of Buddhism, the three major objects of reverence are the Buddha himself as the one who discovers that sacred reality and in a sense becomes a manifestation or an embodiment of that sacred reality. So there's an expression that comes someplace in the Pali Sutras that the Buddha is one who is Dhamma Bhutto, Brahma Bhutto, he is one who has become the Dhamma, become Brahma. And then he is the Amata Data or Amatasa Data, the giver of the deathless. And so then the Buddha then becomes worthy, like the person who is supremely worthy of reverence because of the <coughs> discovery of the Dhamma and his disclosure out of compassion, his disclosure of the Dhamma to humanity 
And so we can say almost that the Buddha is the one who, <laughs> using a little bit like Christian terminology, that he's the one who serves as the mediator between the ultimate state, which is the unconditioned Nibbana, and suffering humanity, or the totality of sentient beings. So the Buddha is the, amongst persons, he is the one who is worthy of supreme reverence. And then of course the teaching, the Dhamma, is also worthy of reverence. And the Sangha, particularly the Aryan Sangha, which is the spiritual community of noble ones, those who have realized and attained the Dhamma, the Dhamma of liberation at least to some extent. <coughs> yeah, there's a sutta, uh, Sanyanguta Nikaya, in which the Buddha mentions, I think it's seven objects of reverence. So reverence for the teacher, reverence for the Dhamma, reverence for the Sangha, reverence for the training, reverence for concentration, samadhi. Even though samadhi is part of the training, but it's given special emphasis here in this sutta. I think to show that it's some aspect of the training that one has to make, because sort of the main task for a monastic would be to develop the mind in meditation, and concentration is an essential part of that mental development. So reverence for concentration, reverence for heedfulness. We spoke about heedfulness just this afternoon. And then this is interesting, reverence for hospitality. Hospitality means when guests come, visitors come, to treat them properly, and to show them, treat them with kindness, provide them with what they need, and this would have a particular significance within the context of monastic life, because in the time of the Buddha, in a different way even up to the present, monastics tend to live a somewhat itinerary life, you know, traveling from place to place. And so if one has a monastery, say in ancient India, this could be a small monastery, and then some group of traveling monks come, they might have been walking for you know, 10, 15, 20 miles to get to your monastery. And the appropriate thing to do is to invite them in, to offer them a seat, to provide them with some, if they're walking barefoot as they did in ancient India, to provide water <coughs> for washing the feet, to provide drinking water, some refreshment, if it's the, light, the evening, you wouldn't provide a light snack. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, in many monasteries today, they use the dark chocolate in the evening, so that could count as a light snack. And then to make polite inquiries of the visiting monks, and then Assuming that the monastery has accommodations, one would provide accommodations for them and other amenities that they might need. Okay, so those are sort of the objects of reverence that are mentioned in the sutta. And then some of the other sort of objects of reverence that have come to play important roles over time. One is this is, in, again, in the context, especially in the context of monastic life, one's preceptor. So the preceptor is the one who brings one into the monastic life, who um, gives one the, what's called the going forth, that is the initial ordination as a novice monk or samanera. I think in the Chinese tradition they say the one who shaves one's head, gives one the tonsure. And then the preceptor is also the one who presides at one's higher ordination, the full ordination. So the preceptor or one's 
particular teacher. Sometimes there's a difference in role of preceptor and teacher. So the teacher might be the one that one has the close personal relationship with, the one that gives you actual instruction in the Dharma and guidance. And often nowadays the preceptor is usually a distinguished elder monk within the particular lineage that one is joining, that one doesn't have a close connection with, close personal connection with, but he is the one who is chosen because of his position to preside at the ordination. Like in my case, I, mean, I think I saw my preceptor maybe two times. One time when he visited my teacher's monastery and then at the ordination. And I don't think I saw him ever after that. So the one that I had the close relationship with was the monk who sort of served as my initial teacher. This was the Venerable Balangoda Ananda Maitreya. Okay, so there's reverence for the preceptor, for spiritual <coughs> teachers. Then in traditional, especially in Asian society, reverence for parents. And something that was very beautiful that I learned takes place in Sri Lanka when I was there. I hope it continues. When children go to bed at night before they retire to their rooms, they bow down to the parents. And then in the morning, if they're like going to school, before they leave the house, again, they'll bow down to the parents. You know, and that, our culture, like bowing down to somebody, means that you're turning that person into a deity. But it's not that way in Asian culture, but rather it's a way of showing respect to the person. And when you show respect to the parents, these are assuming that these are good parents who are bringing up the children with love and with care for their well-being, then it instills this, well, this attitude of reverence that extends even to other elders. And then, when you be, within this tradition, when you become a parent yourself, then you teach your children to bow down to you. Again, not to boost your ego, but it helps to instill that kind of attitude in them, that attitude of reverence. And then there's an interesting sutta that occurs, I think it's, it's in the Sangyuta Nikaya, or the, I think it occurs both in the Sangyuta Nikaya and the Anguttara Nikaya, with a little difference. This is, the Buddha is sitting in the vicinity of the Bodhi tree right after, or soon after his enlightenment. And then it occurs to him, I should find somebody to whom I can show reverence since it's sorrowful to live in the world without having anyone to revere. <laughs> but then he considers that as a renunciant, I would have to show reverence to somebody on the basis of virtuous conduct or sila, on the basis of samadhi, meditative absorption on the basis of panya or wisdom or on the basis of vimukti, liberation. And yet, sort of the Buddha is using his supervision to sort of scan the world to see who he could show reverence to. And then it occurs to him, and he, he's not thinking this boastfully, because he's completely eliminated all sense of ego. But he says, or he thinks to himself, I cannot find anyone in this world who is superior to me with respect to sila, moral conduct, with respect to samadhi, with respect to wisdom, with respect to liberation. But I still want to show reverence and respect to somebody or something, to honor it, and to live in dependence upon it. And so then it occurred to him, let me take the Dhamma itself that I've realized as my object of reverence. And so then he said, I continue to live on 
throughout my life, honoring, respecting, revering, and venerating the Dhamma itself. And then according to tradition, this is not in the suttas, but I think it comes in the commentary, the Buddha felt special gratitude towards the Bodhi tree that had sheltered him during the period of his quest for enlightenment. And so it's said that after, in that period after his enlightenment, he stood in the vicinity of the Bodhi tree, I think it's said for seven days or three days, I don't remember, sort of just staring at the Bodhi tree, feeling gratitude towards it. And so for this reason, in traditional Buddhist countries, the Bodhi tree becomes an object of reverence. I know this is the case in Sri Lanka where every Buddhist temple that's worth its claim to be a Buddhist temple will have a Bodhi tree. And so those Bodhi trees are descended, many of them are descended from a branch of the original Bodhi tree that was brought to Sri Lanka by King Ashoka's daughter, who is the Buddhist nun Sangamita. And that tree was planted in the ancient capital of Sri Lanka, Anuradhapura, and then it grew and it thrived for many centuries. And then many saplings were taken off that original Bodhi tree and planted in, Bodhi, in Buddhist monasteries. And then I think that original Bodhi tree has a number of descendants that are now serving as the source for saplings that are brought, that are planted in new Buddhist monasteries. Okay, so the Bodhi tree, the stupas, these are also called chaitiyas or dagavas, images of the Buddha, relics of the Buddha or objects of reverence. And so in many Buddhist temples or Buddhist monasteries, they will have just even just one little Buddha relic which is enshrined in a special place. And amongst the Buddhist relics, the one perhaps in the Buddhist world that's most highly venerated is the tooth relic of the Buddha, which is kept in a temple in the city of Kandy called, the temple is called the Dalada Maligawa, the temple of the sacred tooth relic. And I lived in a forest which was just behind, it was on a hill, just behind the Temple of the Tooth. And so I had many occasions to go into Kandy to visit the Temple of the Tooth. And that tooth relic, it is kept in a kind of casket made of some precious metal. And that is enclosed within another casket. And over that casket, are offerings that have been made over the centuries of precious stones, jewelry, like queen, kings and queens have offered their precious stones and jewels and jewelry, necklaces and bracelets to the tooth relic of the Buddha. Then also Dhamma books should be treated as objects of reverence. Particularly, you know, we, t we tend now just, you know, we read Dhamma book, maybe put it on the table, and I have, to, I have to confess I also have this fault, that sometimes we might put other books, secular books, on top of it, somewhat carelessly. But the proper way to treat the Dhamma book is also as an object of reverence, to treat it very carefully, not to fold the you know, when you want to keep track of the last page that you left off, not to bend the corner of the paper and then close the book on that corner. You can use a bookmark to keep track of the page. No, it's serious, I'm not sure. So you reference specifically to the sutras or just to any book about Buddhism? I would say particularly to books that contain the sutras. Okay. The sutras. Of course, other books about Buddhism should also be treated with some degree of 
maybe not the same degree of reverence, but with some degree of care, you know, with some degree of care and you know, protecting the sort of integrity of that book. But in like many Buddhist monasteries, <laughs> there'll be a special cupboard in which copies of the Tripitaka will be kept behind lock and key. <laughs> like one of my teachers in Sri Lanka used to say, sometimes a little bit sadly, used to say, it's too bad those books are always kept behind lock and key. <laughs> Okay, and then there are various ways to show reverence to the objects of reverence. So, one is what's called in Pali and Sanskrit is called Anjali. So this is joining the palms together and putting the palms to the chest. Sometimes putting the palms up to the forehead. Another is Vandana, which is bowing down as a sign of respect. Um, one is called Pradakshina or Pradakina, and this is circumambulating the object with keeping your right side towards that object. This is done especially in Buddhist countries to the stupas. The stupa, it's a memorial mound. Is there anybody who doesn't know what a stupa is? Okay, yeah, it's a kind of big mound. Do we have any images of it here? Okay, I have to resort to the usual remedy these days. Do a Google search. <laughs> you can do it in the images section of Google, and then you'll get images of the stupa. It's a, a mound, sort of a cone-shaped mound. And it comes to a pinnacle at the top, and inside, there are embedded sacred objects. It could be relics of the Buddha or relics of great monks of the past. It could be I don't know, pages of sacred text. But one doesn't have, they're never taken out, so one never gets to see them. But they are taken to be sort of objects of, of veneration in Buddhist countries. I think the, before Buddha images were created, the way in which the Buddha was recollected by the Buddhist community was through the stupa or dagaba. Later Buddha images were created and so they became the center of focus. Okay, so the Padakshina is circumambulating the stupa, keeping one's right side to, to it. Then homage, this would be like going like Namo Tassa, Bhagavato, Arahato, Samasambuddhasa, praise, recitation, recollection, and meditation on the qualities or virtues of the Triple Gem. Which is actually a kind of approach to meditation which is not too often taken up by Westerners <coughs> who come to Buddhism. But I've learned to do this during my days of Sri, in Sri Lanka, the, especially the recollection of the Buddha. And I found this very, very valuable way of opening up the heart to the devotional approach to the practice. And it helps to plant great sort of faith and devotion and reverence towards the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha in the heart. And of course this is like one of the main planks of practice in contemporary Chinese Buddhism, which is the Nian for recollection of the Buddha, now especially the Buddha Amitabha, Amitabha. Okay, the next qual whoops. The next quality which in a sense goes along with reverence, sort of as the counterpart of reverence is humility. And humility is 
opposed to conceit. So the human mind naturally tends to give rise to conceit or false pride, sense of personal importance and value based on various externalities, social class, the wealthy think they're special, race in this country, white people sometimes think they are special, nationality, we think America is what the indispensable nation, the essential country, beauty, those with beauty pride themselves on their beauty, beauty, I mentioned wealth already, those with high standing in education, special skills, success in business, learning, eloquence in speaking, fame, praise from others, size of one's, <laughs> size of one's retinue, circle of admirers, um, nowadays, what is it, the number of followers on Facebook? <laughs> um, ascetic practices, my practices, I'm more austere than they are, skill in meditation practice, even it's taken to be meditative attainments. Well, actually, there could be real attainments that then act as a ground for the building up of pride and conceit. And so humility is the attitude that, it doesn't mean self-humiliation, it doesn't mean self-degradation, but it means developing the sense that a, a, rec a recognition of what is truly important is not these external bases for building up a sense of self-importance, but what's really important in you know, value is eliminating unwholesome qualities and developing wholesome qualities. And so there's a sutta that I chose, a passage from that sutta to illustrate this. So here the Buddha is comparing the character of the bad person with Asapurisa, and the character of the good person. So, and he's doing this with respect to monks. So he says, a bad person who has gone forth from an elite family, a family of high caste kshatriyas or brahmins, a rich family, a powerful family, one who is famous, learned, and so on, considers, I have gone forth from an elite family or I am learned, but these other monks haven't gone forth from elite families, or they haven't gone forth from a rich family, powerful, powerful family. They're not famous, they're not learned, and so on. And so then he praises himself and disparages others because of his family, and so on and so on, his learning. So that is the character of the it doesn't mean a really bad person, but it's just the, the one who's not a good person. Okay, but the good person <laughs> considers thus, it is not because of one's family background, or one's fame, one's learning, and so forth, that greed, hatred, or delusion are destroyed. So even though somebody has, gone for, has not gone forth from an elite family, even though somebody is not learned, yet if he has entered upon the way of the Dharma, he should be honored for that, he should be praised for that. So he puts the practice of the way first, and he neither praises himself nor disparages others because of his family or any of the other factors or his learning. So that's the character of a good person. Okay, so how does one overcome conceit and develop humility? So I've just thought of two ways that this can be done. So whatever kind of achievements one might have, whatever kind of good qualities one might have, whatever sort of external advantages one might have, one reflects on karma, that I receive the results of my past karma, 
So whatever good things I have now is the result of my past karma, or at least might be the result of my past karma. And whatever deeds I do in the present, good or bad, they will bring their results in the future. So this is one way to develop humility, is reflection on karma. The other method is reflection on non-self. So whatever achievements one might have, even if one has great success and meditation, achieving various jhanic attainments and so forth, one examines them in the light of the three aspects of non-self. This is not mine, I am not this, this is not myself. Okay, so those are some methods for overcoming conceit and developing humility. And then I just have a note here that humility manifests itself in bodily action, in speech, and in thought. Okay, so the next one is contentment. And so there's Contentment is emphasized very much as a virtue in the monastic life because when one enters upon the monastic life, then one has to learn to be content with very simple and basic supports for one's life. And so the basic supports for the monastic life are the robes, alms food, the dwelling place, and the dwelling place, also medicine, so they're not mentioned here. And so, this is the text on what's called the lineage of the noble ones. So the monk is content, first he's content himself with any kind of robe, then he speaks in praise of contentment with any kind of robe. So he praises this, to others, so that others who follow his example will also learn to be content with any kind of road. <laughs> okay, if he does not get a robe, he is not agitated. <laughs> and if he, well, he has to have a robe, of course, but if he, <laughs> he, he, needs, he wants a new robe, if he doesn't get a new one, he's not agitated. And if he gets one, he uses it without being attached to it, and he does not extol himself or disparage others because of this. Okay, I speak of contentment with any kind of robe. <laughs> you see, there's this distinction in robe colors that I mentioned last night. <laughs> and so there are the bright orange robes. <laughs> be distinctive of the town and city monks. So like if you go to Sri Lanka and you're in the city or in a town, the monks that are walking the streets, usually they'll be wearing bright orange robes. <laughs> so that's almost like the sign town or city monk. And then the darker robe, the sort of mahogany, reddish-brown color are taken to be the marks of the forest monk. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had another, I have another robe. <laughs> it's a little more orange than this one. <laughs> and I mentioned the distinction, I think, in a class or some discussion in the monastery. And as I was leaving, somebody one of the students in the class said to me, then, then, then you must be a town city. <laughs> I don't know what showed on my face at the time, <laughs> but I was thinking, what are you saying? I'm a forest man. <laughs> And after she 
history was gone. I had to take, you know, the corner of my robe and look at it. I said, really, that bright orange? <laughs> doesn't look bright orange to me. <laughs> okay, so anyway, becoming serious again. Being content with any kind of robe. But if, well, of course, if one's robe is getting worn out, then it's quite an order to... Usually in the monastery will be a place where they store robes that have been offered, and so it's quite an order to ask, there will be a monk in charge of the robes, whether you can receive a new robe, and if he's fulfilling his task properly, he'll say, why don't you come and take a look at the cabinet and see which kind of robe you like. <laughs> That's where the greed sort of swells up <laughs> for that, you know, looking at the colors. You know, you think that monks get beyond these things, but it's not completely true. Even forest monks will have little degrees of competition. Whose robe could be more forest monk <laughs> than the other forest monk? You know, so this is sort of, call it middle of the road forest monk. <laughs> but there'll be the kind which is... <laughs> no, that's all, all, pretty much all. Was, I think mine is more foresty. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, I do that in the city. <laughs> So there's a kind of, you know, it's almost a maroon, brownish maroon, which is like, you can imagine that he hasn't been sleeping under the trees, <laughs> hasn't lived under a roof for months. Okay, then being content with any kind of alms food. So I want to offer Giovanna a little job if she doesn't find <laughs> Satisfaction here, you can come to the Tuangyan Monastery. <laughs> At least be a part time cook there. You can't take her. <laughs> you know, when I was living in Sri Lanka, believe it or not, I had a dream that I was in New York's Chinatown looking at all of the Chinese restaurants and thinking, which one shall I go to to get some Chinese food? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I live in a Chinese monastery, actually, in that place for the last 11 years, <laughs> where there's Chinese food every day. <laughs> But occasionally, some Sri Lankan people will come bringing the Sinhalese food. Then I feel happy. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in Sri Lanka getting the, Sing the Sri Lankan the Sinhalese food every day, and then thinking about the Chinese food. But still, even though one likes this, likes that, one has to be content with whatever one gets. And one of the good practices that we found in Sri Lanka they say going an arms round in Sri Lanka is different from going an arms round in a country like Thailand, where people, in Thailand it's the regular practice, so people prepare the food in advance, and I think when monks go on an arms round, the people are actually waiting on the street, they set out little tables and they put their little bundles of food on the table, and when the monks go by, and the people just take the food and put it in the bowl. And so it tends to become a rather automatic pra uh, process. Whereas in Sri Lanka, it's not common for monks to go on alms round. <clears throat> so I used to find that sometimes when I would go into Colombo in the, in the city, and staying at a monastery in the city, just to train myself, I would go on alms round in the city. And we always know that because people don't have food in the, prepared in advance, this, we go at arms round like 10.30 in the morning, 10 in the morning. So they wouldn't have, they might have leftovers from breakfast. 
but they won't have any kind of sumptuous food, like nice, delicious curries. And so we call the first day of alms round in Colombo is the bread and bananas day, <laughs> where people will give slices of bread and these little bananas, and yet one has to be content with it for the day. And it's good training, like just to practice being content with bread and bananas for a day, or sometimes the leftovers from the breakfast. Okay, then contentment with any kind of lodging. And then the fourth is what the fourth aspect of these the lineage of the noble ones is finding delight in meditation and in the abandoning of defilements but not praising oneself and disparaging others because of this. Oh, also we had some two teacher. Yeah, so we have in this verse we have gratitude as one of the inner virtues to be developed. And so here I just took this passage where the Buddha says that there, there are two kinds of people who are rare in the world. One who takes the initiative in helping others, and the other is one who is grateful and thankful. But yet this is a kind of quality that one should develop as a way of sort of they call it way of strengthening one's sense of one's relatedness to others. Like in the monastic life, we think with gratitude of everybody that helps us, that supports us, all of our supporters, because we live in complete dependence on the generosity and help of others. And so we do, like when we receive offerings of food, then we do the chant, to confer like blessings on those who make offerings of the food. And then we think of gratitude of the people who provide us with the food every day, with the material for the food, who provide our robes, dwelling place, medical care, when we need medical care, and so forth. And in everyday life, it's also good to think with gratitude of the people who help you, could be parents, teachers, senior friends who might help you, give you advice. Anybody who helps you in any way to develop this kind of mind of thankfulness. And this gives great joy and happiness and inspires a real wish to be able to help others. Not so that others will be grateful to you, but it's kind of comes out of the recognition of how we live in this these relationships of mutuality and reciprocity. Okay, then the last blessing in this verse is a somewhat different character from the others. The others are developing what I call the inner virtues, virtues of character. But here, we are laying the foundation for the development of wisdom. And the starting point for developing wisdom is listening to the Dhamma. In the Buddha's time, you know, there were no printed books, no written books. So to learn the Dhamma, one has to go to the monastery to listen to either the Buddha himself or accomplished disciples teaching the Dhamma. I don't have that passage here, but I know it. So it, there's a number of suttas <clears throat> which speak about five stages in the development of wisdom. <clears throat> and those five stages begin with listening to the Dhamma. So one begins by listening, by attending, say, Dhamma talks and listening to the Dhamma. But it's not enough just to listen. One has to imprint the Dhamma on the mind. 
So in the Buddhist time, because people didn't use writing, it was a pre-literate society, so the way to retain the Dhamma in mind was to memorize the teaching. And so there would be certain teachings, I guess, that were, the wording was fairly fixed, and people would learn them and then memorize them. <coughs> and memorize the teachings in order to imprint them on the mind. Even if you don't remember the entire discourse, but to take the key points out of the discourse and then bear them in memory. And I think to make that process easy, this is why you see so many of the Buddha's discourses are structured around numbers. Because if you're not relying on writing, you have to remember things and then you have to teach things, <clears throat> becomes much easier if you have a numerical code. So we have five precepts, seven factors of enlightenment, four foundations of mindfulness, eightfold noble path, five of this, six of this, twelve <laughs> of this. Yeah, so when you learn the numerical schemes, then you can memorize, you can remember more easily. And what one finds, at least what I found over time, back in the past, in the past, I used to memorize some suttas, that as one memorizes certain, I guess you would call them, circuits in the brain that are normally lying dormant in us get activated. So over time it becomes easier to memorize more and more. Unfortunately, after that, period in the early, mid-1980s, I moved too much into a literate culture. <laughs> and so those circuits of the brain have now become atrophy, atrophy. They've sort of withered away. So the text, in the text, the Buddha speaks about certain wrong ways to listen to the Dhamma. And, oh, I was going through the, see how bad my memory is, I was going through the five ways of learning the Dhamma. Okay, so you listen to the teachings, then you remember them, and to imprint them on the memory comes the third step, which is reciting verbally. So if you recite verbally over and over, then the actual wording will become sort of imprinted on the mind so that you can recall it more easily. Okay, so if you remember, recite verbally, pretty much you're doing what a tape recorder can do. But the next two steps take you beyond what any tape recorder can do, and that is one has to examine the meaning of the teaching. And then the fifth step is to penetrate it with wisdom. And so when you listen to the teachings and listen in the right way, here the Buddha speaks about wrong ways to listen to the Dhamma, disparaging the speaker, disparaging oneself. Oh, I can't understand anything. I have such a dense mind. I'm never going to learn the teaching. Disparaging the talk. What a boring talk. <laughs> Okay, one is unwise, stupid, obtuse, and then one imagines that one has understood what one has not understood. <laughs> so it seems the fourth is not really a way to listen to the Dhamma. I don't understand its position there. Okay, five right ways to listen to the Dhamma. One doesn't disparage the speaker, but one is open to, the, to accept what the, what the speaker says. One does not disparage oneself, but one has the confidence that one could understand the teaching. One does not disparage the talk, but one listens attentively, and one is wise, intelligent, astute, and one doesn't imagine that one has understood what one has not understood. It's, I have a question. It's a very general question, but yeah. I think one of the things that really bothers me about the Buddha's teachings is that we often don't know what we don't know. Yeah. So that fifth one, the fifth one is, was it, 
is kind of tricky. Like, yeah, yeah, okay, one imagines that one is understood, but one is not yeah. understood. I think this is where humility comes in. So, if one has a humble attitude, in fact, this is also where maybe the next a factor that's mentioned in the next verse is useful, and that is discussion of the Dhamma. And so, when one has, I, I don't want to jump the gun by taking away tomorrow morning's <laughs> presentation, but when one has discussions on the Dhamma, then one gets to sort of compare your understanding with that of others. And then if when there are disagreements, it could be that it's, the subject can be viewed from multiple points of view, but it can be that there's a conflict between what's really correct and what is wrong. In that case, if it's over, say, the actual wording of the text, then you could consult, say, the canonical text to see who is understood correctly or not. I think maybe we take like a little break and then we can come back and then just have like open Q&A session.